Hello everyone, welcome to my talk. I'm excited to be here today at DevCon CZ and I hope you are excited too. It's quite a lot in the day. Um, I hope I can keep you entertained with this interesting topic, uh, a topic which is close to, uh, to my heart as well, uh, developing in Java. Uh, and we're gonna take a look at uh, Quarkus today. So let's get started. Um, a couple of things about me. Um, I am a tech evangelist at Red Hat, uh, technical marketing in other words as well. Um, I've been a Java developer for many, many years. Uh, if some of you have heard about Java AWT uh, or worked with Java Swing back in the days, or if you've done Java 1.1, then yes, we are talking about the same time. Um, I worked uh, a lot with CICD in the past, continuous delivery, uh, back in the days, it was called continuous integration, and before that, it was just called automation. So I've done a lot of that with uh, some of the systems like IRIX, etc., or Unix, um, and, and ship software through that as well. Um, I've worked with interesting things like struts and Java E as well. Uh, I've also done OpenStack automation and Kubernetes automation as well. So bringing all of that experience together, I want to share this uh, session, uh, some knowledge with you today. Um, of course, I work with Vertex uh, and Quarkus, so this talk is heavily um, uh, geared towards that. And then, of course, I have some of those uh, things that you could share. Uh, you could look at, for example, GitHub, Twitter, etc. Uh, feel free to subscribe and follow. Uh, so yeah, so what is development? I mean, we've been developing software for many, many years. Uh, some of us for a couple, some of us for more, and the industry itself a long, long time. Now, development, as it says, is, is fun. Uh, I love it. I, I hope you love it too. Uh, in development, of course, there's many different phases. There's planning, uh, you know, analysis. Uh, yeah, we can take our headphones off for that. Uh, development, uh, you know, the most fun part, I would say. And then, of course, some fun there with testing and integration. I'm sure you've had your fun uh, with quality assurance, uh, quality engineering. Uh, different things happen and different war stories come out. So it's it's an interesting, exciting time. And of course, deployment. Now in our talk, of course, what I wanna focus on is development. What does, what do we have for, for Java developers in store? What can Java developers as of today uh, do uh, in their development? How can they be faster how can it be made more simpler easier what kind of those features that makes it more development productive so let's let's take a look at that later today um, of course I mean when we talk about development all of you must have had different experiences like I said I was doing AWT back in the days I was doing you know automation with uh, uh, with Unix and Linux systems etc uh, and of course, doing Java development, which was going through cross platforms, like deployed many, many different platforms and operating systems across the world. So when that happens, I mean, all of us come through and come from different backgrounds and are working on these different platforms. Um, you might be doing microservices. You might be doing serverless applications on one of the cloud providers or on Kubernetes. Um, you also might be doing event driven um, applications and of course in some cases you might be doing applications in a traditional old way so Java as of today runs almost anywhere right and all of these different kind of environments and uh, architecture patterns need um, uh, need us to create those different patterns and applications uh, in a more easy and simplified manner. How does Java uh, help us with that today? Uh, of course, um, there are many different tools out there to work with. Uh, you know, you could look at um, uh, development kits, which are provided by cloud providers, for example, to integrate there. But then again, you, what you're really looking at is how can I be productive? How can I have the same experience that I do on my local machine? Uh, being able to connect to environments like Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift as an example, uh, do the same microservices serverless event-driven application development as well in a simplified um, experience. So, so that's what's happening today. And, and of course, all these um, 
uh, different uh, architecture patterns needs different kinds of tools and libraries as well. So <clears throat> if you've been developing Java for, uh, for a long time, I mean, there's no hidden truth about this. Uh, a couple of years back, I think prior to Java 9 as well, um, there were issues with, uh, for example, containerizing Java applications. They won't stay, you know, stay up for a long time. They use a lot of memory. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, startup time, uh, overload, um, you know, uh, overhead uh, loading classes like, uh, you know, that you that you might not actually need sometimes. So uh, not a lot of them and most of them basically you don't need. So there's a lot of memory overhead in compilation, doing it, you know, at startup time, etc. cetera, um, made Java much, much, much slower at, to start up with, right? But then again, if you if you even started, you might have even heard prior to Java 9 that, you know, containers were crashing, uh, you know, boundaries, etc. Those things, of course, have been, uh, uh, have have longer long been fixed, but still, I mean, from a container perspective, Java becomes uh, used to become a memory hog. So that's 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 the truth that was out there. The heap would get bigger and bigger, um, and of course, uh, that would create challenges. Now the challenges, of course, are there because uh, Java was created in a different context of time, uh, where we were looking at big machines and and deploying a lot of applications uh, in there as well. So if I just kind of quickly go back, what I was, what I would say is like, you know, uh, with with a multi-application server that would run, um, we would expect applications to run on it, and we don't expect it to, um, to 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 die anytime soon. And it would run the application lifecycle would be for months. Uh, whereas, in a microservices world, in a serverless world, you're looking at you know, days and minutes and seconds of um, application lifetime. And that, of course, challenges Java because Java was created from, from a different context when it was done back in that time. So how does that change today? We're going to take a look at it. So our world, of course, is full of, you know, different things. We have legacy applications, you know, traditional applications that run with Java. Uh, we want to go into microservices. And, of course, we want to go into uh, writing functions as well. How do we do that? So, okay, so Java has problems with containers. Is Java dead? Uh, funny enough, if I try to search something like that on Google, it gives me like, what is it, 49 million hits or something. So, uh, so, but it is, it is not dead, right? There is, there's a lot of things that Java can still offer. So what is Quarkus? What can Quarkus do to solve this problem? I mean, simple quark is an elementary particle, uh, us being the hardest thing in computer science. But, you know, that elementary particle, that small thing is what we are looking at. That is exactly uh, the kind of Java we want to work with, because come on, if we are going to do um, serverless functions, we want them to run quickly for a couple of seconds. We want them to die. And then, of course, we also might want them to scale. And we do not want to wait for that to scale. We want it to be fast, efficient. You know, whatever kind of library we use, we want it to be quick um, and does the work. So, of course, Quarkus brings, um, and this talk is about Quarkus, so uh, with my bias, of course, um, Quarkus will run uh, and with your microservices. I mean, there are platforms or frameworks that are out there already that do, um, that can help you with microservices. However, Quarkus is built in a way that it runs with a very small memory footprint um, and it can and it can start up very quickly etc so it's it's a really good fit for microservices and you can scale it even further down and and you can write functions in java as well you no longer need to just write go and change your language just because you wanted to write functions and java was slow enough you can now do that in quarkus uh, with quarkus so we'll take a look at that today as well so Let's take a bit more detail, right? I mean, what does Quarkus really do? Um, Quarkus has, um, you know, it, it works with, with GraalVM. Uh, Quarkus has a JVM mode. So there's a native mode, which is the GraalVM mode. There's a JVM mode, which is which we can run, let's say, with OpenJDK. And then there's traditional cloud native stack applications as well, right? Traditionally, how you would write your microservices. So this, for example, is a very, very simple example of, uh, of a REST application. 
Here you would see a the traditional stack just to print a hello world endpoint uh, takes about 136 megabytes um, of your memory. Uh, if you look at uh, Quarkus and JVM, it's 73 megabytes. I can trim that even further down with Graal and native to 12 megabytes. Now, of course, these are different use cases when it comes to native and JVM, but then with JVM, even you see almost half of the time is improved. So there's a lot of optimizations that Quarkus is also doing. Um, <clears throat> Quarkus is, you know, supersonic. It is extremely fast as well. Uh, to sub milliseconds. If I was to look at a simple REST endpoint um, doing um, Quarkus uh, with Quarkus native, it's almost like 0 0.016 of second. But then again, of course, if I do JVM, it goes up to one second only, not four seconds or five seconds or 10 seconds. It is, it is, it, it is a much, much more faster runtime. So imagine you want to bring up your um, um, serverless function which is really, really small, uh, does a certain thing, you know, goes out, calls a specific API, does some processing and finishes it up. You know, you're looking at sub millisecond times here. So it's, it's not extremely, uh, it's not slow, it's extremely fast. Uh, you could write your microservices with Quarkus, um, uh, let's say for example, on JVM, you can make them run for even longer sessions, right? So you don't have to uh, stop, for example, uh, like in Quarkus native, which is more geared towards serverless, you know, of course does not have all the awesome uh, garbage collection algorithms that JVM would usually have, but then you could choose JVM. And even in JVM, it's less than a second that it starts up, for example, and uses an extremely little time of, um, a little amount of memory. Um, then of course, um, let's take a look at a REST plus CRUD application. <clears throat> and in a REST, uh, plus CRUD, so simple, you know, create, update, delete kind of application using a database at the back end. You're looking at Quarkus Native doing, you know, again, some millisecond startup times, whereas Quarkus JVM goes a little bit higher, goes up to two seconds. Of course, there's database connections, etc. All of that that comes into play, but you know, Quarkus still has optimized runtime for that on the JVM. And with the cloud native stack, again, that goes to its double amount as well, which goes up to almost like 10 seconds. So you're looking at a runtime, which is giving you extremely small size, at the same time, giving you some extreme performance as well. And, and that is what Quarkus brings to, um, to, to the Java world. So what is, what is Quarkus? Sub, supersonic subatomic Java. Uh, as we say, it is a, it's a Kubernetes native Java stack. Uh, Kubernetes native, it means that it, it literally is geared for um, for Java to run on Kubernetes, for Java to run as serverless functions, for Java to run as microservices, and for Java to perform in these environments, just like any other language and even better in many cases. And it's tailored for GraalVM and OpenJDK hotspot as well. So it's not just about that it um, uses uh, native uh, GraalVM functionality, but it also optimizes uh, with OpenJDK as well. Uh, so you can still run, uh, like I said, with, uh, with JVM mode, and you can still get optimizations in there as well. And again, it's crafted with a lot of uh, awesome libraries as well. Like for example, if you were working with integration code with uh, Camel, you have uh, Quarkus Camel as well that you can use uh, to write all your routes and patterns that you're used to in your integration you can do that too. So Quarkus has some awesome libraries there and we're gonna take a look when we get to the demo part as well. So this is how our world looks now. I mean, it, it was a bit different a couple of slides ago and it should be different now. Now we have our uh, Java mascot everywhere. It's, it's in our microservices. Uh, it's running some of our legacy code. And of course, it's also running um, the, uh, the functions. Now, of course, legacy code or traditional application service style applications. Uh, that's not what Quark is, is fit for, but Quark is definitely fit for microservices and serverless. So more on the right hand side than on the left hand side here. So perfect, awesome. Let's, um, let's get into our demo. So we're gonna switch my screen here. Give me a second. Okay, 
<clears throat> so my environment, hopefully um, uh, you're able to see this as well. Um, so what I'll do is that, uh, of course, I have a project already created, which is D2. Um, and, you know, I'm using IntelliJ. You can choose any, um, uh, any tool you like. So typically you could just go in here, say, hey, create me a new module. Um, and in your module, you can say, I want to create a Quarkus module and select your extensions, etc., etc. So that's one way of doing it. It's, it's part of the IntelliJ uh, mod, um, plugins as well. So you can, you can use that. You could also go, for example, uh, onto the browser. Um, and <clears throat> if you went to the browser, let's just do this. Um, if you went on the browser, uh, you could go on something like uh, code.quarkus.io. Um, and on code.quarkus.io, uh, you could also select uh, whatever kind of extensions you want. You can search them, for example, select them, and then, of course, you can download that or, or, or push to GitHub as well. So that's also kind of, um, kind of cool uh, that you could do that. Um, I am not going to do that today. I will be uh, working more on um, using something called the CLI. So Quarkus has a CLI, which I have installed, of course. Um, and <clears throat> what it does is it has a couple of, well, let me just show. It has a couple of parameters. You can create your application. Uh, you know, you can build it. Uh, you can add extensions, etc. So it's, it's quite user friendly in that sense. And I'm quite used to, since I run on a Linux machine here, I'm quite used to um, running um, uh, Quarkus through CLI as well. So I'll just say Quarkus. Uh, create let's say d2 was working let's say d3 right so I create uh, demo 3 here um, and it's going to go um, and, and create from code.quarkus.io it's going to create an application now simply of course I'm using um, IntelliJ so I'm just going to say hey uh, you know just drag in this uh, this module uh, for me and we're going to do that d3 uh, okay, finish. I can just do that here as well. Oh, okay. Did I just, oops, yes, I made a mistake. Let's do it again. <laughs> Let's create Quarkus D3. So I just had to change my directory. So now I have my, my demos. Just gonna do that again. Um, import my module. I was wondering why there was an extra one there, but okay, never mind. Um, and maybe just in case, I want to delete this right. Import. Okay. Delete. Perfect. So just to keep things clean. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a D3. So let's go in D3. And in D3, I have. So I've created this application, you know, through CLI. Now I could do Quarkus extension list, and it's going to tell me which extensions like already exist. So it says Quarkus REST easy always already exists. I can say Quarkus dev, and it's going to start a local Quarkus session uh, for me to start developing Quark. So usually if you were developing in Java, <clears throat> you would be, uh, you would run something uh, then you would try to compile it, then run it again. What Quarkus does is something called live coding. So you can see it says here, uh, live coding is activated. And my application is already listening on localhost uh, port um, 8080. So if I go on my, um, my localhost here, I can see I have uh, my application already loaded. Um, I also have my hello endpoint, which is just like the generated code that has already been written. Um, and then, of course, I also have something called slash Q slash dev, which is basically uh, which we call the developer UI. Now, this is pretty awesome because now here I can see all the different extensions that Quarkus has that are loaded into my current runtime uh, that it actually uses. And also it shows me, hey, these are the beans that are loaded in your environment. Uh, you know, these are the interceptors, etc. 
and since it uses arc yeah, here you can see that arc is loaded um, and and a lot of other stuff right and then of course the config editor as well it shows me the um, the configurations that i currently have now this will of course change if i actually also um, uh, added more extensions it should it should typically change so we'll we'll see how that works as well so let's go back to our uh, localhost 8080 and we can see our application is there perfectly and here you can access it everywhere it gives us a bit of group application you know etc etc uh, stuff like that so hello rest easy is out there so let's do a simple thing let's go back and <clears throat> change um, the uh, IntelliJ uh, in our IntelliJ let's go back and change our greeting resource so it says hello rest easy and let's let's just say hello dev con awesome and then we <clears throat> just go here click and here it's live <clears throat> reloaded everything so you're actually coding on the fly doing the stuff um in in quarkus um as you go along um, so we can just uh, keep on playing with this and and we keep on doing this and this will work awesome so you can see it goes like that but what about what about if i made a mistake sometimes we all make mistakes how does that work so it will throw an error right away and not just simply um <clears throat> the full stack trace of everything that's going on but at the same time also uh, showing that hey this is uh, a reverse stack so you can see that you have a problem here you expected a semicolon rather than going all the way down you get a reverse stack you can see that here um, and you can also see it on your um, on your console so so let's uh, <clears throat> let's quickly take a take a look at our browser as well um, so if I go on the browser I do the same thing and you will see that yes i have exactly um, um, the same problem what about change it back in my intellij uh, like here and i pressed save uh, i go back again try again refresh and there you go dev comp is awesome so now we have the changes so it kind of like you keep on doing that and it keeps on um, uh, it will keep on working exactly um, the same way okay perfect so let's go back to our IntelliJ and we're gonna open so 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 this was the part where you say there is actually zero configurations at this time in my application props this is just the default application that I just created with a greeting resource now what I can also do is I can also if you were if you wanted to do um, testing like for example um, uh, you like test driven development you could run your you could start running your tests as well so here um, I just press R and here it says hey you have a greeting resource test and it expected hello rest easy but by the way your test is failing so I can actually start to code on the fly and say hey it wanted to be hello rest easy so let's just take that that's a bit of cheating but well, you know we can cheat a bit um, and here I save it and you can see now my test is passing so I can see I can actually work live do my unit tests, change my unit tests, save them and they're doing that imagine that if you were doing that uh, without this kind of a functionality you're here just can start creating new methods and functions um, for your application and and do the proper kind of test driven development if you wanted to do that so it's it's pretty awesome uh, that you can you can do that so a great way to get started as well so <clears throat> now let's let's take a bit more look into some of the other things as well so here what i'll do now is so so we've seen live coding how live coding works uh, we've seen how um, how we are doing test driven development that's uh, that's a great feature that you could do in your dev mode we are in quark as dev mode um, what about if I wanted to add, let's say, um, extension? An extension, a Quarkus extension, um, is used that, it, for example, uh, Camel is an extension, 
uh, you know, database access will be an extension. So there's a bunch of extensions that you could basically use uh, uh, with Quarkus. So when I do Quarkus extension list, it gives me uh, the list of extensions uh, that are currently out there. And there is a bunch of them. So the, remember, we saw them on code.quarkus.io um, as well. So now let's just say that I want to add Quarkus extension. Uh, which one was it? Uh, let's add Hibernate. Um, so I add Hibernate on Panache. I will add Hibernate Validator. And then I want a JDBC uh, Postgres SQL database. So one thing I just want to make sure that there is no Postgres SQL database in my system at the moment. Let's just stop that just to make, you sh make sure of that. And we'll be, we'll be saying, oh, why? Why is he stopping the Postgres SQL database while he's adding it over here? So I'll tell you why. So, <clears throat> so I add this extension over here. Um, and of course, I'm in the wrong directory. Fun stuff. Um, now I'm in the project. And of course, I, I added this here. So now if I go back to my, um, to my browser um, and hit the uh, local host and go on my dev UI, voila, I see data sources. I see Hibernate ORM. There is no persistent units, no entities there, no named queries. But hey, there's data sources. And why does it have data source? And it already has a default data source. So what is that? That default data source is the test containers working by default in action in this in the system. Let's take a look at that. So when I go back to my um, local host here, you will see that it started to uh, initialize dev services manage database. And that is basically creating um, uh, the, the container in the backend. So if I went in and did Docker PS, I would see that there is um, a test container that is running right now uh, in the backend uh, Postgres SQL here uh, for my application. So this is awesome. Like I don't really need to we need to worry about this. Every time my application will start uh, in dev mode, it will automatically um, just uh, just do that as well. Um, so <clears throat> so that's uh, that's awesome. I can I can actually do that. Um, let's. Uh, Take a look at application properties. There's nothing in the properties, and you know my um, my database is is just running uh, by default, which you can see over here. If I go back um, now and try to create, let's just try to create a new entity. Yeah, I create a to-do um, entity here, um, and what I'll say is that it's an entity. So similar to what you might be um, familiar with. Okay, let's see, let's see my imports. Oh, somehow seems like name hasn't picked up. Let's see if that works. Yeah, there you go. Uh, extends Panache Entity. Now, Panache, there's Panache Entity and Panache Entity Base. Panache Entity Base gives you uh, so Panache is a is a framework which is which is quite cool, which gives you these uh, possibilities to uh, to work with these. Um, you know, you could use your active rec uh, repository patron if you wanted to. You can statically call the methods, but it's an awesome uh, tool for for running uh, with your Hibernate applications and kind of takes care of all this uh, glue code that you will usually need to write. Uh, so in in my case here, let's say I take my to do application. Um, uh, to do um, Pojo here that I just created and I'm gonna just uh, maybe create some uh, you know simple uh, let's just say in my to do I have string title uh, I want to make sure that this title is not blank since it's the main title and I also want to make sure that this column is unique right so give it a, a 
um, a property which is unit AQE equals to true, right? So I have that. Then of course I want to add maybe an order uh, to this. Now order is is a fun thing because order um, is also uh, something that is in the database. So the database um, <clears throat> we can we can choose a different name um, and we just say hey our column will be called ordering instead. Um, and then of course boolean I choose completed whether my task is completed or not and then maybe so here I will save this and uh, what about if we actually add some helper functions just add some static uh, helper functions as well um, uh, that could be our to do's and we say find completed so get all the ones that are completed and here since it extends panache entity it can actually um, uh, directly call some of these methods so here we return the list of completed items right so i'm just going to cheat a bit here um, and we're saying say find not completed and we call it false just for the fun of it right we can also do something like um maybe delete some of them uh, long delete completed and here we do return delete uh, again because uh, we have uh, we have extending the panache entity we have these type of functions for the period. So this is a simple entity that we just create, right? Just out of the box, a simple portal. Now what happens? Let's let's go and see what's happening on our um, on our browser here. So I'll go back. I'll say, hey, hit my URL again, um, and I should see automatically that there is now entities. There is one entity called to do. There is some persistent units. So create and drop scripts are automatically created um, and then you know no named queries but then again I can also go into the database and here you can see that it's connected to my local you know container database with some default password name and users and some properties as well another cool thing is that I can actually copy these you know um, directly into my application or properties as test and production profiles as well which we will uh, which we'll take a look uh, hopefully uh, later um, as well. So I got a multiple bunch of options here um, uh, that I could use just because I added a new extension. So what about <clears throat> what about let's say that uh, we go ahead um, and we add uh, a simple uh, REST endpoint um, and and see how how that's going to work as well. So let's do that. Let's just go back to um, IntelliJ and we're going to create a new um, a new Java class um, and we're going to say to do resource um, and this of course in this case what we're doing with to do resource is we're making sure that it's our endpoint that is going to serve our REST and we're using REST easy and we're going to use um, uh, Jack's RS as well. So that's going to help us to, um, to, to take our API out. So here we go, Jack's RS, and we're going to say API uh, slash API. And then of course we can say add consumes, uh, media type. JSON just making sure uh, that all of this does that we could also do this on each um, uh, each of the uh, uh, functions but you know just making it easier over here so what I'm gonna do now is of course I'm gonna cheat a bit um, I'm gonna just copy some code uh, long code here in respective time 
and go through that. So, so here you'll see that I mean, what I've done is I've added a couple of things um, <clears throat> and I'm, I've added a get all method, uh, which is using the sort uh, coming out of Hanash. Um, and it's going to sort based on the order of the tasks. Uh, it's going to have um, a function called get one. Uh, we're doing a create, so we're doing a valid to do item to get the actual um, uh, to do item in JSON. And all we do is item.persist and it's going to save it back into the database. So now if I go back to my endpoints here um, and I, I say, well, let's go back to our endpoints um, and I say slash API. Whoa, something is missing. What did I miss? So I've missed a library. Nice. Uh, which library have I missed? We okay. So happens, right? So let's just add that library extension add. And since it, I know this error, it says util dot error list um, is um, so Java dot util dot error list uh, with media to application JSON. That was the error. I'm going to add an extension called rest easy JSON B, and that's the one that basically uh, will help me parse this, um, this JSON. So I do that and Quarks does that. And here you can see that I got a lot of errors doing that. But then again, I, um, I will go back to my browser and I'm gonna click API and whoa, I get another error, do I? Let's see. So it doesn't, it doesn't like Message by writer. Okay, did I miss rest easy? Just gonna scroll a little bit. Uh, let's try this again. And So here we go. Here we have uh, the slash API and we can see the endpoint that it returns nothing. So what if um, what if I did something like created, uh, let's go back and <clears throat> let's go back to our IntelliJ. And if I created uh, an import.sql file, um, let's do that file. And here I'm just gonna drag some of the uh, some of the things that I that I want in, like by default in my testing. I do that, and I refresh my browser. Let's do that, and I can see. Whoa! I have all the different uh, lists here uh, that I added. All the tasks are coming in JSON now. So this is great. Now I have the different you can see how life coding is working. I can do all of this on the fly and, um, and making all the changes as I go along. One thing that we, that we want to do now is also look at remote dev. So you can do all of this, but then you can also do this remotely in, in Kubernetes since it's a Kubernetes native stack, right? What I've done, I've cheated a little bit here. I've already deployed my Quarkus, uh, sorry, my Postgres database. Um, and um, I have, um, it's, it's in here. Uh, what I wanna do now is deploy my Quarkus application as well. So I could deploy a native application by saying minus P native, or I could also deploy, um, you know, a, a JVM application. At this point, from a developer productivity point of view, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter a lot. But what of course we, uh, we kind of uh, need to do is, we need to uh, give some pro properties to it, right? So we need to set up some properties and say, hey, um, this database service is called Postgres slash database. Uh, you need to hit that one uh, with the right password and, and log in because this is no longer uh, about uh, the development environment. This is now uh, going into production. 
So let's, um, let's go ahead and, and do that too. So if I look at my um, application.props, uh, which I've kind of preloaded, I'm doing a drop in create. Um, this is kind of like a staging environment, so we could do that. Uh, we want to see the SQL. We want to see the rest in CRUD, etc., cetera, um, and, and all of those things uh, we want to see as well. One thing I also want to do is basically uh, drag some of the, uh, you know, my UI um, as well. So let me struct files that I copy, which is a Java script and some index to do HTML and all of that. So awesome. So there is, there is my front end loaded as well. So we did do the API parts. Now we also do this. So, so now let's uh, close our dev session here. And basically let's just uh, kind of deploy and deploy our application. So NVN, uh, I'm gonna say deploy, uh, Kubernetes deploy true. Um, <clears throat> but before we do that, and before I forget that, uh, what we wanna do is we want to add the um, OpenShift extension because we're gonna use the OpenShift developer sandbox. So I'm gonna add the OpenShift extension here. Um, unable to list extension, unmatched argument, open shift. Okay. Case, list. Add that already. Yes. Okay, did I miss that? Yes, I did. I actually missed the add command, perfect. So, so now I have the extension added, and by doing this, now open, whatever my um, OpenShift environment I'm logged into, this will automatically um, <clears throat> deploy into that environment. And usually uh, when you're working with um, uh, OpenShift, uh, you, can, you can kind of say, uh, you can see what's, you know, where you are. So here's my link on the server and also my, my project that I'm currently in. So it's going to basically just go ahead and deploy my application in there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to deploy my application into, um, into OpenShift. So let's just go ahead and do that. Simple NVN clean package, uh, uh, Kubernetes deploy true means that deploy it to Kubernetes. OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribution with a lot more other value added niceties. Um, and then of course, skip test. Well, we only have a hello world test, so we can skip it. Let's do that. Um, <clears throat> so now it's gonna start um, basically uh, create a build in OpenShift. So let me just, um, yeah, so here it's, it's creating, if I go in my target directory here, I will see that, you know, it has started creating some Kubernetes manifest files, uh, you know, uh, from my build. Uh, so it understands exactly what it wants to do. It knows what the, you know, what kind of image you want to use. All of those things it already knows. And it's going to start deploying and creating a build, which is an S2I build on top of um, the OpenShift environment. So let's go ahead and take a look at the OpenShift environment, right? So that'll be nice, well, not this one. So here's my OpenShift environment. Um, if I go in my builds, I can see that D3, for example, is being built and the build is running and you can see it's being running there as well. But I can also see that, you know, it's uh, receiving uh, the standard um, input here. Um, it's copying all the stuff going around the environment. I haven't given any specific environment, any specific metrics, etc. Uh, you can observe um, your application here as well. And then of course we're in the topology view where we have our uh, Postgres uh, database as well. So quickly let's go back um, to our IntelliJ environment. And here you'll see that, hey, it's copying a lot of stuff. It's pushing the image to the registry, push was successful, it's deploying to the OpenShift server, and then it says, hey, I did it, and because I have set the exposed route to true, 
it is actually deploying that entire thing um, and then exposing the route to as well uh, on this as well. So let's go back to our OpenShift environment and see how that's looking. So here we can see D3 is deployed. If I go in my logs, I see, hey, the application is deployed. It was pretty fast. It started in less than three seconds, you know, creating container and everything um, and with all the different things in there. And guess what? It also has my application. So if I go here, I can see my my application. If I go on the dev UI, it's not going to work because dev UI, it, it treats it as a production environment right now. Uh, it's not going to it's not going to work. I could also go and say to do dot HTML and here, oops, um, <clears throat> I will have my to do application as well, where I can see what's going on. Um, if I go to my API, um, I will again see my API as well, uh, which has no data at this time, for example. Um, so we can go back to todo.html and say learn for this. That's my new task. So it will just add this there, for example. So stuff like that. So it's awesome. It's uh, my application is deployed. Uh, it's working. It looks great. But what if uh, what if I actually wanted to you know do some remote development, which means I want to make changes remotely. So in in respect of time, which I believe I don't have a lot left. Um, so being quick here, um, I'm gonna let's go back and do some some more settings here. And of course, I'm copying here just to just to make it even more enticing. Um, I've said that hey, I want I don't want my dev services enabled. But I do want you to say, do want you to launch Quark as in dev mode, which means that it's going to add all the uh, easiness for me to work remotely from this machine directly into my Kubernetes environment, which is uh, which is also pretty awesome. And I'm also telling it that this is my um, this is my application, which actually is not. So let's change that. Um, oops, copy. Easy copy, please. Nope. Control C and Control V. So here I have my my route, which is my application's route. So it knows that this is where it needs to listen to. So I've done that. I've made those configuration changes. Same thing. Now what I want to do is I want to say Quarkus and I want to say remote dev. So now it's not just Quark is dev mode locally, it's remote dev, which is the outer loop, which is on Kubernetes. So I do that <clears throat> to the remote server. And if I make any changes, like let's say if we were uh, going back, hang on, let's do this. If we were going to a browser again, and I said, open this app, I can see this page right now, right? So. So this is the default page. But what if, uh, what if I went back and changed this page? What if I just uh, removed index.html? Um, you will see that as soon as I hit this, it is going to try to change that. And it didn't. Okay. Anyways, so if I hit hello here, it does that too. Okay, perfect. So let's go try to hit that. Uh, so index of this thing comes there. But what I'll do is I'm going to rename my to do HTML to be the main index page here. Awesome. And now when I hit the index page, it's going to basically send that out to the application. And here you can see that it actually will reload. Let's just do that. Oops. Here you'll see that it actually reloads that entire page. If I hit that again, now my index page is actually on the to-do.html. Um, <clears throat> let's go back. Let's do something more interesting. If I go on my resource and here I say something like system.r.in Perhaps what I do is that I remove this function completely. Um, and then 
if I go back uh, to my browser, set up this uh, run again, um, you will be able to see that over here it has sent a new Quarkus runnable jar uh, into my container very quickly and in my browser my application is loaded. So if I try to say learn something new it doesn't really do anything for me because guess what there is no create function anymore. So how about we recreate that create function uh, save save it again so here I have my create function again um, I'm gonna save it um, and I'm gonna go back to my browser again um, and here if you go back and see in IntelliJ as well that it has actually sent all those details there which means that if I active today that will go in and now I have something that is that is working I can say is uh, you should start the Quarkus project on github that's done visit Quarkus website you know get all the active projects and you can see all of that is working so that's that's a little bit of uh, prelude into the different features with with Quarkus with dev services etc so let's just go back to our <clears throat> presentation there and um, let's uh, let's let's talk about that uh, to finish it up so what we've seen so far is that you can you can easily have the different configurations you know simplified something that i did not show though but like uh, in in respect of time but happy to happy to talk about it later and uh, is where you can actually copy your configurations through the Dev Services console as well. Um, so, so there's the Dev Services UI in the Dev mode gives you all the different possibilities and configurations that you can copy off as well. If you did not know them, for example, so good productivity features there. Uh, the configuration, as you saw, is extremely minimal. Uh, you get the reverse stack trace too. Um, you get all the different extension views in your Dev Services UI. Um, developer UI, you, you get your, you know, test containers integrated by default. So if I was to add any other database, um, for example, MongoDB, or if I was working with Kafka streams, all of these will also be easily used. Or if I was using something like the Kiko project, it, that will also get loaded and easily doable uh, through the dev services as well. Awesome developer UI, uh, continuous testing. We also saw that easily able to test applications uh, you know, if you're going, t going towards TDD, that's some great work. Remote dev with Kubernetes, like we just saw it right now with some basic functions, but you know, you can do like pure live coding uh, with that as well. And then of course you can deploy microservices or functions onto, uh, onto Kubernetes as well. So that was a, that was a, that was a small uh, demo for you to kind of get inspired and hopefully you will like it. One of the other things that Quarkus also does, it, it has a reactive core, and that's why it is so performant too. So which means that you can basically write endpoints with reactive and non-reactive code at the same time, and, and Quarkus understands it. So you don't need to spin up different projects to do it in your same, uh, you know, by domain, whatever, you know, distributions you have in your application, you can easily choose to uh, do reactive, I possibly recommend it that way. But at the same time, if you wanted to mix and match in one endpoint, you know, go ahead, you can do that too, because Quarkus is reactive in its core. Uh, lots of frameworks, 300 plus extensions today, uh, whether you're using, uh, you know, Kubernetes extensions, Keycloak, uh, uh, you know, Jaeger, um, Camel, all of those extensions are out there for you to use. And if you wanted to write your own extension, you can do that too with QuarkUS as well. So to end the session, how do you get started? I use the developer sandbox, so you have the link there. Uh, you can sign up for um, a free OpenShift developer sandbox, which runs for about 14 days. You can deploy applications to it and you know kind of play around with how that works. Uh, you'll get more uh, of this on Quarkus.io. 
Um, I have also attached the source code for the demo app here. And there's a bunch of other things that you know you can also look at. For example, the IDC validation report that talks about the Quarkus performance that we, the numbers we saw, for example. So in the end, again, um, thank you very much uh, for listening uh, and hope you liked the talk. And if you did, please uh, give it a thumbs up and um, looking forward to speaking to you again on the channels. Cheers.